Did I just mute? Nope. Okay. All right, we are live. We're live. Great. Welcome, everybody, to a webinar entitled Sharing Results with Participants. Uh, my name is Carl Stepnowski. I'm the principal investigator on the Overlap Study, which is a research demonstration project funded by PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. The COPD Foundation is the primary awardee on the project and includes partners at the American Sleep Apnea Association and University of California, San Diego. As part of the project, we see issues that are important to patients, and we wanted to further explore several issues that are important and sharing data and results back with research participants is one of the ones that's uh, come to the forefront. We have three great panelists with us today. Each is a nationally recognized patient advocate. What I'd like to do now is introduce each one of them and ask them to share some of their experiences and in being involved with research so you get to know them a little bit better. John Linnell is a governing board member at the COPD Patient Powered Research Network and on the board of directors for the, U U uh, for the US COPD Coalition and on efforts and international support group for COPD. And he's an advocacy captain for the COPD Foundation for the state of Wisconsin. Welcome, John. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm currently uh, living in Wisconsin uh, I've been involved with the foundation for about uh, six or seven years. I was diagnosed with COPD in late 2005. I left the workforce because of my COPD in late 2011. I became involved in advocacy because it's, it's COPD is my disease. I, I want to own it. I want to learn as much as I can. And through my work with other patients, uh, particularly with research, because I participated in uh, some uh, clinical trials, clinical studies, and I found that we're not getting any of the information back, but if we did, we'd be more apt to participate in future studies. So I'm just a huge advocate of involving the patient at the, from the very beginning of the research, in the planning stages, through the end, and then you know sharing back. I always tell people to own, own your disease, whatever it is, and with your physician, be a partner in care. And I think by participating in research, we can be and want to be partners in progress. Absolutely. Great. Welcome, John. And we have Hugo Campos, who's a patient ambassador for the NIH's All of Us Research Program. Uh, he's patient co-investigator on the P-Scanner Clinical Data Research Network and chair of the California Precision Medicine Consortium Community Advisory Board. Welcome, Hugo. Thank you, thank you, Carl. And so, it's, uh, thank you for having me, and it's great to be here. Um, I, yeah, I'm involved with uh, with a couple of um, big projects. One of them is the the All of Us Research Program. I think what's unique about it is that the we are looking to recruit um, one million Americans, and we're going to follow. It's an observational study. And uh, these people are going to be followed. Everyone who participates, myself included, I'm a participant. Um, but uh, we're, all, we're going to be followed for 10 years. I think what's unique about this program is that it looks to recruit uh, a diverse population throughout the U.S., uh, populations and communities that are usually not well represented in research. So it's a pretty, pretty unique um, and um, uh, uh, sort of a one-of-a-kind uh, study and, and the, unprecedented really in a sense uh, in its scale and and uh, uh, and um, and reach um, so I think so I'm involved in, in, in also with P scanner which is part, uh, one of the CDRNs the clinical data research networks for uh, uh, one of the CDRNs for uh, for uh, the Cornet mm -hmm. uh, I think there are 34 uh, clinical data research networks <clears throat> and, um, and and so I, so I participate as, uh, in uh, in that sense um, uh, as it, helping drive in what I can and bringing the participants voice in but also part I participate as um, you know if there are studies I have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy I have atrial fibrillation which is a very 
common, uh, the most common arrhythmia in the United States. I think there's about two, two and a half million people in the U.S. with atrial fibrillation. Um, with a link to, as, as you guys have uh, pointed out in the past, uh, to uh, sleep quality and, and apnea. Um, but um, uh, I think it's, it's very important for all of us to engage in research in every way possible so we can drive patient-centric research, so we can have our voice heard, particularly if you're, under, if you're part of a community that's underrepresented, LGBT communities, uh, Latino, uh, Hispanic communities, uh, African-Americans, all of um, folks who don't typically have a voice in research should engage and participate. And I'll shut up so we can talk about the topic mm -hmm. at hand. <laughs> That's great. And it'd be interesting to hear if, if the All of Us research program, since it's 10 years in duration, is, is giving any data back or results back along the way. I just thought of that as, as you were talking. The, the whole point of the program is to, so, it's a, so for the All of Us, it's a, thank you for that question because it's really important. It, a, a key foundation uh, or component of the All of Us research program is to return value to participants. Right. Um, so, so it is a very important part. And part of my role as, as participant representative, not my role as a participant ambassador, but my role as participant representative within the California Consortium, it is to, is to, um, uh, is to raise issues of, uh, point out uh, what's, what's, how, what does that mean to return value to participants? Right. Um, so we're, we're, we're learning together. We're, we're hopefully, as, as is part of your efforts, Carl, and, and all of us together, uh, to unpack that and sort of make sense. And, uh, and that's why everyone should participate. And every person listening to this webinar who obviously cares about this topic should engage and should take on a, a, a role and, and have a voice. Great. Great. Look forward to learning more about it. And our third panelist is Adam Amder, who is patient co-investigator on the Overlap study, a patient co-investigator on the Sleep Health Mobile App study, which is uh, available on, on the Apple App Store, and chief patient officer at the American Sleep Apnea Association. Welcome, Adam. Thank you for all the titles, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, John. Good morning, Hugo. Good morning, Carl. Uh, look forward to having a, a stimulating uh, bi-directional conversation about uh, sharing data with participants with uh, you all and with uh, our audience listening in on this, this webinar uh, for this important for Cornet overlap study demonstration project uh, as part of our engagement um, to involve our patient partners uh, and our communities and our overlapping communities. So John being from the COPD background, Hugo being from the cardiovascular AFib background, and myself being from the sleep background, you actually have a trifecta of, of three of the most common chronic diseases uh, that are plaguing our country today. And what happens to each one of us uh, affects each one of our communities. So I think having this conversation and figuring out uh, how we can learn best from each other and how we can take that back to our communities is uh, vital to going forward and uh, breaking the, the so-called status quo because from my back my perspective and my humble opinion you know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over expecting a different result and uh uh yeah three patients here who, who all if we all had to become their own app this out for themselves to become shared decision makers uh with their clinicians and all the other key stakeholders in their in our in our um, healthcare journeys uh, that we live with every day. So, that is my attention span. That's about it. <laughs> right. Great. Okay, welcome everybody. So the next slide just shows the overview of the webinar. So what I'd like to do is provide background information on the sharing of individual patient data. So we're just gonna refer to it as, as IPD to keep it short. Um, but not just sharing it in general, but specifically back to the individual research participants and really to discuss this topic from the perspective of, of the patient or individual participant. Uh, talk about some of the facilitators and barriers associated with sharing the data and results back to participants and then talk about how the field might move forward and how, and how in some cases it, it is already moving forward, for example, the All of Us program. 
Um, so what I'll do is present um, some slides and after each one we'll have uh, commentary um, by, by the panelists. And then after we're done with the slides, we'll open it up to Q&A and, and comments. So for anyone attending on the Zoom platform, you can enter comments right into the question and answer box, the Q&A box. And uh, for those who want to uh, join by speaking, you just raise your hand. Um, we can unmute you individually at that time. This helps us not unmute everyone at the same time. And for those of you who might be attending the webinar on Facebook Live, if you have questions or comments, just type them into the comment box and we can address them during, during the Q&A period. So I just wanted to lay the groundwork for the topic. Uh, there's kind of a, a spectrum of sharing um, data and results back, back to participants um, or sharing in general. So I'll just kind of, we'll just kind of describe the, the spectrum. On the one side, there's the sharing of individual data and or results from clinical trials and research projects directly back to individual participants. So this would be individual specific data or interpretation of those data or clinical measurements um, back to the individual participant. At the next level up would be sharing aggregate results of the trial back to individual participants. Sometimes it's back to the in, uh, group, uh, the sample that's included in that particular research study. And in parentheses, we said sometimes during, because a lot of projects are designed to recruit an entire sample complete the, the pro, have the sample complete the protocol, analyze the data, and have one, one set of, of results. Uh, sometimes other projects have a series of experiments that are done, so um, results could be, could be given along the way. And as we're seeing now, for example, with the All of Us program, some of the durations are getting very long, so if it's a 10-year study, there can be an analysis o over the course of, of the years of the study. And then results can always be, be shared back after the study. The next level up from there is making data sets open access for, for secondary analysis by others, whether it's back to researchers who might be interested in doing it in academia, industry partners, or the general public. Uh, there's a new role for citizen scientists who are interested in going back and, and looking at existing data sets. And then the broadest levels disseminating results from research studies and clinical trials in, in some of the more traditional ways through publications, medical journals, news stories, social media posts, and, and getting uh, results out that way. Um, panelists, anything I've missed? Anything you'd like to add to this, to this uh, description of kind of this broad spectrum of, of sharing of data and or results? Don't be does, shy. It to, does it seem to cover it? I'm, I'm good for now. I've got a lot to say, but not quite yet. <laughs> okay. And, and what's interesting is I, I think with the, with the advent of, of the smartphone, I, mean, I, I think d sharing of individual data points is something that's, that's relatively new over the last uh, five to, to 10 years. Um, okay. Yeah. So what are individual patient data? We figure the audience is fairly broad in, in terms of uh, knowledge base of, about research. So we just wanted to give an example of what kinds of data are collected during the course of a research study. It's a wide range of things from participant characteristics, often referred to as, as demographics, age, gender, income, education, ethnicity, race, things that help us understand um, uh, or characterize the, the group uh, who's being studied in the project. Clinical measurements. So this could be from medical devices, uh, such as a, a blood pressure monitor, a CPAP machine, an oxygen concentrator. Uh, it could be from questionnaires, either questionnaires that are validated and, and typically used in, in medical practice or in, in research, or it could be questionnaires that are being developed. Uh, medical history, so for example, what's the history of different medical conditions that someone might have, what family members had, had different uh, illnesses and disorders. Clinical laboratory results, so whether it's from blood draws, imaging like x-rays, um, that's a whole other uh, group of measurements that might be done and, and be considered uh, individual participant data. During the course of a trial, it's always important to keep track of adverse events in case something untoward happens. So for example, bleeding or any kind of, of thing that's unexpected. 
And then clinical outcomes, uh, for example, hospital readmissions, uh, death, things like that. And then sometimes there's also details of the randomization method, how people got randomized to, to the different groups within a clinical trial, and then details about the protocol or the treatments that were undergone. So this just gives you some sample example of, of or sense of uh, the kinds of data that are collected as part of the research trial. Anything you guys would like to add? I would just like to say that's the most comprehensive individual slide of really explaining about all the different types of data uh, that we as, as humans and participants uh, are contributing um, to potential research. And if you think about it, it's always been siloed and now to see it all combined together in one place with the end user, the patient, and me doing a broadcast from a, from a mobile technology right now to be able to have a conversation with four right. doctors, is, so with a doctor and with, with, with two leading patient advocates. This is the way of the world. So, you know, embracing the technology, not that it's got all the answers and, and solve all our problems, but, but learning as we go with it to improve our quality of lives is, is just going to be the ultimate um, advent, advantageous or just, it's, 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 you know, without, without, it's going to improve our quality of life. You know, it's right. the five minutes with a doctor compared to looking at this, all this data in one big fail swoop and having the whole story uh, is just, we're that much more knowledgeable about our health uh, every day and throughout the course of a lifetime. Right. So. Adam, you actually make a really great point. There is a missing category on here and, and that's wearable data. <laughs> right, patient generated. I, I was going to mention that patient gen generated data. No, and beyond that, even also uh, uh, environmental data, perhaps, right? Uh, data, because, you know, if you think about the, 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 the clinical encounter, it's just sort of like the tip of the iceberg, right? The mm -hmm. visit to the doctor, the experience, the interactions with healthcare are um, a, very, a very small portion of the entire patient experience. In, clin in the clinical world, research is a little different, but it's, but in a, for, for someone living with a chronic condition, that interaction with healthcare, even, even for someone who has frequent visits to the doctor, it's, most of their lives aren't really spent in, in, in these interactions. So it's spent really yeah. in self-care. So, and, uh, and the patient is making decisions on um, how to care for herself or himself, how to how to uh, how to eat, uh, whether or not to exercise, where to live, um, how to manage the environment in which they live, how to manage depression, how to manage uh, mental health. Um, mm -hmm. All of these aspects are are uh, important, a wealth, a great depth of information and data that a lot of times the patient is the only one who has insight and access into. Um, Right. The, kid, the kitty came in, so <laughs> <laughs> um, so I didn't tell the kitty I was we're, we're not supposed to be disturbed. Yeah. But, uh, but it, so it's these these are important, and so I think that's that's also another category. And I think when you look at, for example, precision medicine, and uh, when you look at uh, the, the future of research, patient centered, um, patient driven. Uh, as as Picori, um, uh, sort of created, it, it started pretty much in, in, in creating the, the opportunities for us to develop this whole new way of looking at research. Um, we must we must keep thinking about it. what does it mean precision medicine. What does it mean uh, to, uh, to 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 the, to to design uh, treatments that are personalized that really answer questions. Uh, or the needs of individual um, participants in research, individual patients. So these are important. So, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on. And then the slide just goes over the stakeholders in, in medical research in terms of all the people that have an interest in it. And, you know, historically, it's been kind of participants have been subjected to the research protocols, um, but that's, that's really changing now. We've, we've changed, trying to change the language to using participants as folks who participate and, and are, um, I can't say 
equal, but, but um, have a different role in terms of the process. So patients and participants, including families, significant others, caregivers, uh, are, are clear stakeholders. And, and what we found now with, with BCORI is it, clearly the most motivated set of stakeholders in, in terms of what's, what's going on, how it's going on, and how quickly it's going on. Uh, researchers obviously uh, have been a stakeholder in, in medical research. Clinicians, the only thing I want to say here is oftentimes the academic model is a scientist practitioner and a lot of times some of the some some great questions have come out of clinical practice in terms of clinicians finding knowledge gaps and that's helping to identify research questions um, i think what we're seeing especially working uh within picori is that patients are a phenomenal source of research questions research ideas prioritization of of those uh, questions and we have to mention regulatory and IRB folks. Um, they have the oversight of how research is, is conducted. And then funders and granting agencies, which really are the genesis of, of what uh, gets funded and, and, and really how it gets funded. And the thing I want to say here is we're, we've all read the funding opportunity language. They can be 30 pages long and five pages on the idea itself, but 25 pages on the administration of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about maybe a paragraph in there on, on patient data sharing. So um, thoughts on the stakeholders, uh, any comments? Um, well, I'd, I'd like just to comment that you, you mentioned PCORI and you mentioned the language that's in everything from say the IRB to the informed consent. And I, I think PCORI is kind of a, a, a trailblazer and so are some other, uh, well, the institutions that get funded by PCORI because I think they're kind of forced to but they're involving, this doesn't have to do so much with sharing back at the end of the, the, uh, the study or the trial, but it's involving the patient from the very beginning. They're now using patients to word the informed consent, to put it in language that we understand. I mean, I've, part of my work, I've had to read and dissect, well, I don't understand this, and try to put it in words that patients do understand to make mm -hmm. patients more of a partner in the entire process. And I just think that, you know, PCORI is wonderful about insisting that uh, if patients are involved, uh, they want uh, patients also to be on the data safety monitoring board. So I think just, it's all part of, you know, I go back to my little buzz phrase, partners in progress, involve the patient at the very beginning. Right, right. agreed. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a well-known, uh, common phrase amongst a lot of the patient community, nothing about us without us. Yeah. Um, and, and PCORI has really been the, the, the genesis and the groundbreaking uh, and, and, and starter ignition for, for, for bringing out this patient-centric research movement. Um, but what I think Carl really touched upon is, is really, especially a lot, you, John, myself, and Hugo living with these chronic diseases, a lot of our issues are happening in the clinical environment and even us as laymans who are not uh, researchers, but who are, are in, in, put in the position to help translate to our communities, um, the difference, because, you know, I, I was always under the impression, and I assumed, and we know what happens when you assume, that when you walked into a hospital, they were learning from you. I never knew until the last few years that they weren't. And, you know, I was just another person coming in there, and that now there are evolving learning healthcare systems and that we are learning from the, the, the prior people before us. Um, no, but, because that... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm just going to just to jump onto that. I've learned and found out through, through my work in, in studies that the scientist researchers quite often have never met a patient. Yeah. They've, they've, never, they've never met or interacted with the people that they're studying. Yeah. Or the, the, it's, it's, the, the T1 it's, cells and how the macrophages do this and that, but how those things affect the people that they're doing the research for, which, which is me the, the, and you, the, the, the patients, mm -hmm. and it really opens their eyes. I've had scientists come up to me after, say, peer review panels that I sit on as, as a, the patient, uh, the consumer reviewer, and say, I never knew. And so they're going back to their laboratories and their knockout mice and whatever things that they work with, with a whole new 
uh, set of eyes or their eyes are wide open more because now they, they have a better understanding of what they're doing and how it's, a, how it's affecting that population of that, that chronic illness, disease, condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and those are the kinds of things I think that are important for the research community to hear and, and for some changes to happen. Okay. Um, it, it's actually, it's, it, before you move on, Carl, I, I just want to throw in one other point that John uh, one of the PPRNs is the About Network, which is uh, the ladies with uh, BRCA, and they've actually trained so many qualified patient citizen scientist researchers that they don't, they can't even find enough doctors in their, enough clinicians in their field to be able to match them up with four research projects. Right, so, right. You know, it's, it's, but the core is, is done a lot, but we also have to, we're, we're, we have to realize we're bringing up a very old uh, traditional paternalistic, maternalistic uh, system that, that's not used to having patients involved in these discussions. It's always been a one-way conversation. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, you find out real, really, really quick, you know, who, who's looking to evolve and who's looking to, to do things the same old way. Right. So, and you have to bring up two, two separate issues there. One is the training and, and how do researchers work with patients on the teams, which I think should be a whole training course in and of itself. Um, but the second thing is the amount of funding for some uh, disease entities. I mean, it, it's not, the funding isn't a linear correlation with the prevalence of a disease. It's more the political clout of a disease. Um, so that's oftentimes why we hit, hit on some limitations too, unfortunately. Okay, wanted to share some, some stats um, in terms of, there, there's a great uh, uh, center that does a survey every couple of years on clinical trial participation and, and various aspects of it. And so um, here's, here's one survey finding 95% of clinical trial participants have positive experiences overall, but many feel let down at the end of the study. And here's two quotes from, from those surveys. You give them your last couple of blood draws and that's it, you're done with it, everything stops, you get cut off. Uh, the other quote is you're extremely well informed, but once you come off the trial, there is not one letter, nothing. And so these are fairly common experiences of, of survey participants. I'll just review these next three stats too, and, and then we can open this up. 90% of volunteer of study volunteers want to know the results of their clinical trial, so nine out of 10. Uh, nearly 80% of study volunteers never hear back about the results of their clinical trial, and 70, almost 70% 70 of study volunteers would not participate again if not informed of the results of their clinical trial. If this doesn't raise alarm bells for, for researchers, I, you know, I'm not sure what would. Uh, what are your reactions? Well, you know, to me, this is obviously, it's, it's, it's clear that we're on the right path in, in terms of uh, there's much work to be done, but we're, we're, we have started, right? So we're, we are on the right path in terms of um, uh, including patients as partners in research. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's really about uh, the work uh, has to be about continuing changing culture. And, um, and, and what I was going to say ab ab about this in a, in a previous slide, which uh, ties well into this, is that it's really about the partnership. When you're bringing uh, different stakeholders in, uh, to partner together, everyone is included. Everyone brings a perspective that is of value and mm -hmm. uh, everyone has something to contribute mm -hmm. and when we're not including all stakeholders we're missing out on on, on perspectives that right. would be uh, important so right. yeah so I, I, I think we're I, I'm hopeful I, I don't mm -hmm. I don't want to I think we're waking up to a, a reality that will will change research for the years to come Absolutely. Well said. Anything else anyone would like to add? 
Yeah, well, maybe this is a good time to just jump in and, and cut right to the chase as to, you know, why, why should the researcher, why should the trial, why should the study share back? I mean, why, why should they do it? Well, let's just ask the question that everyone does when they do anything. What's in it for me? What's in it for me, the researcher would ask. And sure, with, with the cons are, yeah, it's going to cost a little more money to do share back. It's going to maybe require more staff. It may require more time. And you've got to work it into the budget. It, you've got to start planning that from the onset. We right. get that. So what's in it for me? Why should we do it? Well, three key things. Uh, if the participant is made to feel important and given the data back, they're probably more likely to participate in another trial. So you're mm -hmm. not going to lose that patient as a future participant in, in mm -hmm. research, either with your outfit or down the road with anyone else. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, patients can be a superb source of recruiting other patients. I, I know mm -hmm. a lot of uh, uh, trials have trouble finding, finding patients. They, they, I've had, they've come to me on Facebook and said, we need help finding patients. Can you put the word out? And we mm -hmm. easily we can find them to do a survey or, or at least I never find out if they actually join the trial because that's confidential. But these researchers come back time and time again saying, hey, we need your help again. Because yep. patients listen to other patients. And that's Great. it. And they feel important that way. And mm -hmm. third... It, it gives you the nice warm fuzzies. You've done, the, you've done the right thing because data sharing is important because we, we deserve it. it. It's our information. Make us feel valuable. We, uh, we want it. We want the information. And it, it's the right thing to do. Right. Yep. Agreed. Good. You're anticipating some of the later slides on on moving forward, so that 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 really lays the groundwork for for that discussion. And you know what I would say is, uh, from the researcher perspective, even though we know we do one project, and if we we did the right thing with those participants, it'd be better for other trials. It, there are limitations, and and so even though that stat that 70 percent may may not participate again. I mean, this is something I think the researcher community has to take a closer look at and, and say, you know, we are part of a, a bigger community and, and this is what, what we need to do to make sure that, uh, that we're, we're doing the right thing. Um, there's, I have three slides that all present um, a, a single aspect uh, from, from those surveys. And I've highlighted and read the one that is most directly relevant to sharing data back. And this particular survey item asked about what were the most and least liked clinical trial elements. And what we circled here was the most liked aspect of participating in a clinical trial was helping to advance science of my disease and, and condition. So people are clearly, four out of 10 are clearly interested in learning more about their own disease and, and condition. Um, which I think really helps to support the idea of, of sharing data back. Um, the next one asked, what's the most important information that influences your decision to participate? And clearly there's a lot of, lot of things here, but uh, nearly six out of 10 people said, if I would receive a summary of study results after my participation ended. So people are clearly telling us that's an important aspect of participating in trials. And then in terms of what information are they most interested in receiving, um, over seven out of 10 said my individual study results and a summary of this overall study results. So clearly seven, over seven out of 10 are asking for this information. In the upper right corner, are they getting it? So uh, we had talked about this internally, right? 30% said that they received a summary of their study results. 55% uh, said they did not and 16% said they didn't remember. I think we were all a little surprised about that 30% number, right? So um, you guys actually already summarized this. Why, why is it important? I mean, number one, it's, it's health information that 
or dispense are clearly interested in. They want to learn more about themselves. They want to learn more about what's going on with the research in their, for their disease and condition. It, it helps increase the likelihood of, of future participation. And then from a societal perspective, this was already touched on too. It can help increase the importance and understanding of research, which can help all of us because if we start to change the healthcare system to be more of a learning healthcare system, that 99.9% .9 of data that's collected in the EMR that won't be for documentation purposes, but could actually be something that, that we learn, learn from. I think Adam, you had mentioned the learning healthcare system and being surprised yeah, that it was I, not. Yeah, and I think what was also surprising to me, Carl, is when we did our, our mobile sleep health study that, you know, finding out that after two, over two years that 70% of our active participants that are in the study, it's the first time they've ever been in a, in a mobile clinical trial, well, let alone a clinical trial, let alone a mobile one. So, I mean, I, I, you know, it comes back to, you know, you know, if you give, you get, if you share, if it's bi-directional, you're going to get people that were, were not, you know, typically involved in, in, in research before, which was primarily white Caucasian males. Um, and this is why, you know, we're looking, that's why Hugo's working with all of us and, and, you know, I, I like to say everyone sleeps and we, we want to look at every population under the sun because everyone's got a sleep component. So right. I lost my train of thought again. Exactly. But what else is new? <laughs> it's, true. it's true. And then ultimately, it, it's just the right thing to do. I mean, it's 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 what what should be done and, and needs to be done. So in the interest of time, I was hoping maybe we'd finish out the slides in about 10 minutes so we can open up for Q&A and and. Uh, and some discussion with the audience on, on, on the webinar. So I have two slides on the researcher perspective and, and what I wanted to do is kind of show this discrepancy. Um, one survey found that 49 out of 50 overall supported the idea of patient data sharing and results sharing, uh, primarily because of the ethical responsibility, but also because of the patient interest. So that's, that's 90 plus percent. Um, Despite the intention and, and the support, uh, we see that many uh, do not follow through. There was one study of, of 35,000 trial records. Uh, they had 25,000 responses to a survey asking about whether or not they plan to share data for secondary analysis purposes. 10% said yes, 25% were undecided, and 64% said no. And so what we're seeing is, is despite the good intentions, and you can include me on a couple of research trials here too, despite good intentions, the follow through is not there. And that was interesting. There was a sub, sub analysis on this one where it looked at funding type and it found that 11% of government funded researchers said yes and 0% of industry researchers said yes, that that data would be shared. There, there's obvious reasons um, for that. Um, and then I'll just share some of the factors that uh, are from the researcher perspective, and, and that is um, having uh, potential issues with the reliability and validity of the data. Sometimes we're doing experimental stuff that um, maybe the results, results um, don't have a clear um, interpretation or they could be misunderstood. Um, sometimes taking uh, more complex data and trying to translate that in a meaningful or understandable way can be challenging. Um, we had talked about this internally before. I mean, one, one clear way is to involve a physician, for example, because some of this might be uh, complex. Uh, there may be cost concerns. So research budgets are often limited and, and don't necessarily require the, the covered costs. I know just putting together a single page for one metric to return results back to participants took uh, several days of, of staff time on a, on a research project of ours. And then there's liability concerns. So not knowing how that information may be used um, and if it might be misused. So it's not to say that these are, are all um, good reasons to, to not do it going forward. It's just to understand some of the, the issues that are on the researcher side and the study team side when it comes to, to sharing data back. Um, you know, I think in the interest of time, we've hit on a lot of these topics already. I thought maybe these would be discussion kinds of topics, but I think in the interest of time, we've, we've hit on, on actually all of these. So I think we should jump right into how do we move forward now. And 
The big, big question is, it's clear that there are some researchers, funding agencies, projects that are moving forward. And it probably represents, if we had to take a guess, five to 10% of maybe the entire medical research enterprise. So how do we create the momentum and the consensus to make this something that's, that's kind of standard um, research practice? And I just threw, threw two ideas up here. One is to work directly with the regulatory and IRB folks, um, help to make regulatory policy changes that encourage and provide the oversight on how to share uh, research results and data back to participants. Um, since patients are having a role in, in multiple areas of the medical research enterprise, having patient stakeholders on IRBs might be something um, that, that's needed going, going forward. And then same thing with funding and granting agencies. I specifically mentioned the 30-page the funding announcement and 25 pages being on administrative aspects of it, a paragraph in there on the requirement to share data back uh, and to share results back uh, could be, that, that, that's what researchers follow. So I think that'd be one of the most important things going forward. I want to throw this out there to you guys. And actually Hugo, I think in your opening statement, you said it's all about, <laughs> it's all about the, the bottom line. And, and there's a lot to be said for that too. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's, I think the most important, the way to move forward would be to move forward would be for funding agencies to really require as part of the contract to, uh, to, to return value to participants. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there, you know, obviously, uh, it, the, the more we do it, uh, the, the more hopefully we'll be able to 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 show that there there's value in that uh, because uh, and i think um uh to make a point to one of the slides that you brought that you had earlier uh, why is uh, sharing data with participants so important and i think um what is uh, the, the reason why it's important is that it builds trust mm -hmm. and so trust is really critical um if you participate in in in, in a study or in a clinical trial and uh, whatever the study is and you never hear back and there is no sense of building a relationship uh, or you don't feel like you're treated as a partner. Um, you, uh, a lot of times people, why would you care to come back? You know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so if, if you, if you treat people as partners, if you treat folks, um, with, with respect, with uh, provide value back to them. It's, so in, in, some, in some ways, you're rewarding their spirit of altruism and, mm -hmm. you, and you are um, uh, building trust. Um, mm -hmm. But so it's a little bit of two things, right? So we, we, we have to, but in order to, 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 to continue expanding it and doing the, the right thing, we must have uh, the agencies, the funding agencies, to require that that uh, that we make an effort because it's it's hard, and doing research is hard, and and there are a lot of things to worry about, and and the researchers have their their uh, plates full, and so it, it, to throw yet another thing in the in the another requirement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you 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 really have to. Um, I mean, it's you, 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 it has to be a you have, people won't do it if you if you right. don't reward it or require it and um, and true. so uh, so I think that's that's what's important. Right. Yeah. John or Adam? Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting conundrum, Hugo, because we 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 want to be as transparent. Uh, from a patient perspective, but now putting on a, a researcher perspective, uh, you got to give back the identified information. We can't, we can't look at subjects. We are humans, but we look at them as subjects. So we sort of de-identify them and, 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 and take the emotion out of it in that regard, because then, then, you know, the way our perspective of looking at any of the research is, is biased. Um, but coming back and putting on the patient advocacy hat, you know, yeah, we are the trusted true source. I get solicitations from pharmaceutical companies directly, but I know that if I get it from my patient advocacy association or from the COPD foundation, I know they vetted it. I know it's in our patient's best interest. Therefore, I'm going to even, I'm going to take the chance to even read it and consider it. 
Um, and that's sort of, you know, what we as at the end users as patient communities and, and cohorts of, of different chronic conditions, you know, we, we are looking for solutions. Uh, we just did a, a survey with, with the FDA where it wasn't, we found a lot of our patients weren't misdiagnosed or undiagnosed for, for, for a year, but it was really for decades uh, that mm -hmm. they went through the system. So to be able to now have that knowledge to go back and now educate not only clinicians, regulators, insurers, and all the different key stakeholders uh, about all these early warning signs and all these red flags that were occurring in our cohort's life, uh, it's invaluable. And, you know, before everyone, you know, if we just left it in the traditional research world, everyone would have just been looking at treating the, the typical outcome. I think what, what's really been important throughout all of this is that patients are really identifying what the endpoints are and what the outcomes and the, that matter to us are that impact our lives um, compared to what, what the standards are. Um, and I know there's a lot of gray area and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, worms in that can, but you know, this, is, this is why we're, we are sharing the data. Uh, it's not gonna hurt anyone, it is de-identified. And it's not only necessarily sharing the raw data, the aggregate data, but also what we learn from this, this research, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, our patients, as we get educated, when they learn that there's been research out there that's been suppressed or sat on or hasn't been disseminated, that we all, would, we all could have used that information years ago, you know, that's, that's, that's not a learning healthcare system. If we learn from this data, good, or bad, or indifferent, and from the research, then we can move forward and, and, and improve quality of life for all of us and all society. Mm -hmm. um, great. great points. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions or comments to post them to the Q&A uh, portion or, or on Facebook Live to the comments section. Another quick point that we didn't really touch on, but it, it's when to share the data. If it's a three year study, and you want to keep the patient as a partner in progress, if you want to keep the patient motivated and interested, perhaps there need to be uh, various waypoints mm -hmm. during the study where at least some data will be shared. It's not going to be the results of the yeah. trial, but at least that, that patient's individual data, you know, here, here's where you're at right now, and we're, we're seeing that we've met our goals in AIM-1, AIM-2, we're not so sure about, or, you know, what have you, but... You, you can't wait until a three-year project is over before you begin the sharing process. Right. Yeah, it, it's so true. It's so true. And, and that's a good lead into to this last one, which is that PCORI's really changed the paradigm in terms of including patients in the planning of the research. John, you're just talking about the conduct of the research and the dissemination. It, it's been great having patient co-investigators on the project because um, if you include updates to the trial participants in terms of the study progress, even for studies maybe that can't release results early on, can talk about how well it's going or how many more people yeah. are needed or, you know, different um, groups that are being included or not included, you know, those kinds of things can really incorporate and, and bring a sense of, uh, sense of belonging to the study and, and kind of ownership too. Um, so it's it's almost it's almost common courtesy, Carl. It's it's yeah, yeah, we we get all hot and heavy. We get them recruited. We sign them up. We need your research, and then we don't you know typically uh, they don't hear from anybody in a year or two or if ever. So if being ever. able to make them feel like they're a part of the the journey and of the science as an individual and as the aggregate is key to keeping them so called engaged. Right. Um, a good analogy would be if a patient goes in for a, a pulmonary function test, just a, a spirometry uh, test, and typically the tech can't give them the results, say, well, your doctor will go through that with you. Well, I understand that, but then if they're told, but the doctor's out of the country and you, you, you'll get an appointment in two months, well, I just took the test, it's my mm -hmm. information, and I have to wait two months, that's, mm -hmm. that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, great point. Good. Um, let's show this last quote. Um, really, like I was gonna put this in the beginning of the talk, but I thought we would close with it. Publicly funded research data are a public good produced in the public interest, which should be made openly available with as few restrictions as possible. And John, you just said in a timely and responsible manner. 
And uh, that really isn't, isn't too much to ask. This came from the UK, uh, common principles on, on data policy, but I think it helps summarize the overall idea here. Uh, any closing thoughts uh, from, from, from any of the three of you before we open it up for Q&A and, and, and uh, open discussion? Uh, you, you mentioned the UK, and I would just like to give a shout out to the, the British Medical Journal because they're, they're one of the few journals that are really requiring that if you don't have that patient involved in the research from the beginning, they won't even publish the study. And I think that's not only do the funders need to require it, but also the, the, the dissemination and the journals need to require it as well. Great point. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's a great point because there's actually a firewall set up. So if, if individual in, individual people wanted to try to access the article of the study that they were interested, they may have to pay upwards of fifty dollars for a single article, which is a is a is a barrier. So so I, I see here that <laughs> Eugenia Brooks has has a question. Can I answer it live here, Carl? Yeah, please do. Okay. Uh, Eugenia Brooks, who is actually one of our, our top patient panelists, she was at our FDA meeting uh, and is online, is very active in our community. She asked, just to address the issue of sharing in many cases, it's an economic issue in that it costs money that they feel will be better spent towards the actual research than to share the research to each participant through the, the mail. And no, no doubt, uh, you are absolutely right, Eugenia. It's, it's, it definitely comes down to money and, 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 you know, the researchers are hands are tied and, and they're doing this on one tenth of, of capability and not being able to get this information out there doesn't necessarily mean it's a priority, but if it becomes a standard, then they realize it has to become part of their protocol uh, in any current research and any research going forward. I'm sure uh, Hugo could comment on that as well. Well, I, I was going to say, uh, it, it, it's so funny, it's, it's a two-way street, right? So. Um, researchers have a great deal of responsibility uh, to share, uh, but but you know what? Patients and participants in research also um, should be asking for 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 results back. Uh, we should be pushing back. We should be whenever we're uh, we, we we engage with research in in a meaningful way, whether it's a, as a participant or as a stakeholder driving the design of the study, or we, we should, we should um, uh, be pushing for um, results to be shared. We should be asking, are these results gonna be shared with me? If there's clinical data, make sure that you ask for copies of that. You know, it's, it's within your right um, to, to, to have access to your, to, to, to view, to, to have access to your health information. So we should be we should be exercising that we should be pushing that as patients and as participants in research. So that way, um, if if folks aren't asking, um, it, there, there's less pressure. Mm -hmm. so, right, right. I think it's you don't, you don't ask, you don't get. Right. Yeah. yeah. And also a quick comment: it sure it's going to cost the money. But it's also it could also provide them money through funding that they might not have otherwise gotten. For example, if they apply to PCORI for a grant and they have a history of sharing and involving the patient mm -hmm. in as many ways as possible, mm -hmm. I would think that PCORI would look upon that application with a little more favor. I, I know uh, the Department of Defense gives out uh, close between two and three hundred million every year through. Uh, uh, congressionally directed uh, medical research program and they involve the patients and have for over the 20 years that they've been doing it every step of the way so they're very similar to PCORI so yeah it's going to cost money but it could give you money also right right great point any other questions or comments from the audience I don't see any other in the Q and A, and I don't think. Sean, are there any 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 ones with anyone with their hands raised? No, there are not. There's, not, there's okay. nothing inside the Zoom. Is is I'm I'm not monitoring the Facebook platform, but if there's questions in there. You might want to be responding to those. No questions on Facebook either. Okay. 
That looks like there's another question in the Q&A. It just came up. Um, let me answer this from Elizabeth Bankert. Uh, I really appreciate John's point regarding language and how patient involvement can force us not to only use the appropriate level of language, but consider that the consent process is a learning process as well. Many patients' health literacy about their own disease can be improved, and both researchers and providers should take the time to teach patients the difficult topics or more complex scientific lingo because you don't know what you're missing until you can't understand it. I couldn't have said that better, Elizabeth. So yeah. essentially, maybe more, more people would ask, if their would ask for their data if they understood the value of their data, no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. um, a, a, another another uh, uh, participant also asked on there if uh, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation will be available. It will be available on the PCORnet site, and we, we will make it available on our uh, sleepapnea.org site under our webinar series as well. Right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, Adam, remember when we first were starting the mobile app study, uh, some researchers would do videos, presentations of what the topic was, why they were interested in it, what it meant for the patients. I found those incredibly um, it just made the research project come alive when, when you had a better sense of the person or study team behind it, the rationale for it, and then what it was about. So in terms of helping to start the understanding about the condition or um, the, the particular topic, I mean, someone mentioned microphages and bench research. I mean, you can really make this stuff come alive. At the last PCORI national meeting, Alan Alda was there and he has a institute for the, for the communication of science. And it was amazing to, to how he would take researchers who would like talk way up here, right? And then they realized that there was a very, there was a better way to tell the story in a way that was just as, as, as um, informative about what was being done, but in a way that was completely understandable and could hook people in. So, so that's sort of really important too. It's like anything in life, Carl, and, and, and you know that you know our relationship better than anybody. That if I can't explain this to my child, then I don't understand the concept well enough yeah. to begin with. And we we've, right. we've got to, it's not a health literacy. It's it's a it's a it's an understanding of what it is we're trying to do here. And we might not have the answers, but we understand why we're looking for the answers. Right. Uh, and if, if if we can get that message across and translated then I think you'll see a change for the better in learning healthcare systems and, and research that will actually change outcomes and not just be research to be published uh, and to go on, on, a, on a, an investigator CV or something of that sort. Right. So, hey guys, somebody else posted a question into the chat. Um, it's the question is what about posting results on clinicaltrials.gov? Are patients unaware that results get posted there or are the results found there insufficient? I think if we're looking for, you know, IP, the individual, you know, results, you're not going to be, if you've got a trial that has, say, 500 people in it, you wouldn't be able to post each individual person's personal information on, on an open website like that. We're looking to have our own information returned to us, as well as a, perhaps a synopsis of some type as to what the study results were. Is that pretty much correct? Right. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I want to say, uh, Carl showed, uh, and I can't remember which 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 slide. Um, I, I took a note here. I can't remember exactly what the point was, but the the the, the reason why folks participate in research, one of the great, um, one of the biggest reasons is is the sense of altruism and to sense to help community. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so w w returning results to participants is an opportunity to build a relationship. Right. So mm -hmm. I think when you put, um, I mean, I, I'm not saying that putting the results in clinicaltrials.gov is, is a bad idea. It's a, it's a great idea uh, and, it, and it should be there. But it's not a way to, to build uh, uh, engagement mm -hmm. and, and to create engagement, well, to create a dialogue and to, um, to, to retain participants in research. Because the results that go on clinicaltrials.gov are sort of at the end of the, at the, the end uh, of it all. The end of it all. So, so it's not, it's, if you're looking at, for example, all of us, 10 years of, of, uh, of a program that will last 10 years, well, over a decade, you have to have ways to engage participants during the course of those 10 years um, and, and, and keep people interested. So, 
So it's more than just that. It's it's how do we how do we create a dialogue and how do we return results during the course of the study, during the during the length of that engagement and that relationship in order to build engagement. So mm -hmm. I think that's what's um, uh, missing. Right. Right. I, I think a really good point, and Mike has just typed this, and I'd kind of like to read it to the the uh, the audience because I think it's very important. It's perhaps a good way to end. Uh, Mike has, uh, I know him personally, a great clinician. He says, more of an observation than a question. I think providing feedback to study participants helps clinicians, researchers ask better questions in the future as well. It helps us learn what's important and what's relevant to the people we're ostensibly helping instead of what we think is important. It's a cycle of process improvement where everyone can benefit. I think that's very well said, Mike. Excellent. Yeah, it, it sure is. And as a matter of fact, for the overlap study, uh, part of our, our first aim was to go to the overlap community and find out more about what outcomes are important to them. So the we, <laughs> the research team, didn't make the decision. It came from the community, and they clearly said, we want better daytime functioning. That's by far the most important thing to us. And so now that's, that's our primary outcome for the study. So it's a great point and a, and a great way to end too, because we're at the, the top of the hour. So I'd like to thank each and each one of, of you, uh, John and Hugo and, and Adam for not just your time here, but for all that you've done um, for, the, for the patient research community. It's uh, what, what you guys thank do. You. Is, thank you for having us.